Welcome to our second lecture covering uh, labor law. Let's uh, go to the material. In our first lecture, we did an overview of labor law. We'll see many of those same terms and concepts we'll be repeating in this presentation. Of the three presentations that we're likely to do, um, this is by far my favorite. I'm very excited about covering this one. This is what makes labor law so addictive, so um, interesting and so captivating by people who are drawn to it. And that is the campaigning and the collective bargaining aspect. So I put the fun stuff all in one lecture. That might not have been so smart of me, but I think that you'll, you'll hopefully see what I'm talking about when I talk about the fact that this uh, practice area is pretty thrilling in terms of, of um, how HR professionals and legal professionals uh, can interact with the law and interact with others. So let's get started. It. We're going to talk about union campaigns. So what does a union campaign look like? It looks very much like any other type of political activity. There's basically two sides um, and they both want to persuade uh, the electorate, the people voting, to side with them. Um, it's, it's just like a camp uh, candidate running for office or maybe uh, partisans, one person who supports a particular uh, bond initiative or a particular constitutional amendment um, and the other side that doesn't. That's the type of di dynamic that we have. So there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one discussion with, with voters, who are in this case the employees, trying uh, to uh, see what's on their minds and try to figure out what's going on. Now that's something that the union is able to do much more readily than, than uh, the employer can do. The employer should not be directly asking workers their thoughts, nor should um, employers be directly responding to um, uh, questions unless they have been very, very well prepped so that they know exactly the ins and outs, what can legally be said and what cannot legally be said. Many employers choose to just have a few people who are very, very well trained, who aren't going to be caught or tricked into saying something that they ought not. Other employers a little bit more risky um, and they will empower more workers once, of course, they've been trained uh, how to handle those situations. Uh, both approaches can be appropriate, but if you decide to allow more workers uh, to be kind of in the hot spot, keep in mind a couple of things. First of all, um, the NLRB, when it looks at unfair labor practices, oftentimes has an inclination to side with the worker. And so if it's a, a contest between a management employee who says X and a worker who says Y, uh, the tie will oftentimes go to the worker. So if a management employee is talking with one worker, with one hourly person or two hourly person people, and those two people are going to testify a certain way, um, it doesn't really matter what was really said. It matters what the testimony is going to go. And certainly uh, the NLRB is likely to side with what the worker's recollection is if there's two workers versus one supervisor. So you can see the supervisor kind of dotted every I and crossed every T and said it just right. But if it was misheard, either honestly misheard or if someone is playing a game, um, then you can get a ULP uh, finding by the NLRB, even though there's been no misconduct. That's one of the reasons why many cautious employers will say, no, we've got to have at least two management people present for any of these conversations to ensure that uh, the, the uh, comments are not mischaracterized. Another reason why some employers don't have their rank and file supervisors answer these questions is that sometimes employees will try to trick employers, uh, particularly relatively low ranking uh, supervisors who, you know, honestly have a lot of other things on their mind and who haven't been trained, you know, for hours and best practices in this area. <clears throat> And so they're not expecting to get the question. The question is phrased in just the right way that it opens up uh, the supervisor to saying something that might be considered unlawful. It may be an accidental misturn of a phrase, but still the words were spoken and there can be legal uh, liability as a result. So for those two reasons, um, it's not a bad idea to restrict the folks who can answer these types of questions to just a handful of folks. What you can do though is for those supervisors is you can train them how to handle it by saying, that's a good question. Um, let me take it to our 
expert on these issues and I'll have him or her get back to you about that and make sure that that supervisor knows to immediately take that question to the right person and to promptly have that person get back to the um, rank and file employee so that the rank and files employees if it is a legitimate question and sometimes it will be and sometimes it won't be but when it is a legitimate question it's answered promptly and clearly and when it's not a legitimate question at least you have closed the loop and the person who's uh, playing a bit of a game can't go back and say oh they never came back to me with an answer or at least they can't honestly say that so the union can discuss with employees all day long and tr can try to persuade directly um, the workers amongst themselves can talk but the supervisors and managers have to be careful about what they say to workers and more importantly have to be very careful about what they ask workers some of your best union avoidance people will be your rank and file employees. In a union campaign, those are the most credible. Um, unfortunately, you don't have a lot of control over what those folks will say. But you, in a very in a significant size workforce, are going to have a few employees who've had a negative experience with the union. Maybe it's their own experience. Maybe it's an experience of a family member or friend. Maybe it's something they read in the paper or a television or movie show they saw. When they relay those stories, they will have a lot of credibility in many cases because the other workers will think, well, gosh, Bob has no agenda here. He's just saying what he thinks. When somebody from management shares that particular opinion or uh, an attorney who's been hired by the company to, uh, to, to talk down the union says it, that person has quite a bit less credibility. And so um, you want to um, create opportunities for those anti-union folks to express their views. But on the other hand, you want to make sure that work is still being done and you can't um, screen content. So um, you can't say, oh, you know, the, the anti-union people can talk, but the pro-union people can't talk. Um, and so you, you, you want to give opportunities for there to be some flow of, of conversation, but on the other hand, you don't want it to paralyze the workforce. So discussion and persuasion is a big part of it. Um, the the, the dis distribution of literature can also be a helpful mechanism here because it can set the topics for that discussion. I mean, the, the workers are going to be talking about it. And when you give them a handout, you're giving them a, a conversation starter. So you're feeding information to the anti-union people. Now they have raw material to talk about. The folks on the fence, they're also given some things to think about. And so this can lead some, to some discussion topics. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the distribution of literature will be, you know, one flyer a week. Uh, you're really looking to probably a one-sided document. Um, you don't necessarily want to have the highest production values on it. You don't want it to look too slick, too prepared by some kind of outside organization. Um, it loses some of its um, uh, credibility in a way if it looks like somebody from outside the unit was too involved in creating it. So you don't want that the production values to be too high. You also don't want it to be too wordy. You don't want it to be uh, written like an English paper or something. Many times your hourly workers are going to not be people that necessarily like to read a lot. Um, and that may not be their thing. And so you want to create a document that communicates without having it be sentence after sentence. Uh, bullets can work. Uh, humor can work. Um, uh, uh, cartoons can work, uh, visuals can work, graphs can work. Those things can be very, very persuasive um, to the audience. You don't want to overwhelm folks with too many of these brochures. Um, that can become frustrating. It's a little bit like, um, you know, when there's a campaign, it seems like every day in your mailbox you see something about that particular campaign. After a while, the candidate, I mean, excuse me, the, the electorate's going to be resenting getting yet another handout. Uh, once a week is kind of a common method to do this. Um, sometimes you're going to be responding to what the union is saying in its handouts. And many times you will be able to get those handouts. An anti-union person will give it to you or you'll see some stuff thrown on the ground that seems to be what the union is distributing. Um, sometimes you will decide you don't want to just be reactive. You don't want to just be responding to what the union's saying, but you want to send your own positive message. And of course, there's a balance of positive campaigning versus negative campaigning. Um, negative campaigning usually does work. That's why our, our uh, uh, 
po political candidates oftentimes use it, but there is also something to be said for taking the high road. And so depending upon the issues in the campaign um, and what is happening in the campaign, uh, deciding what the tone ought to be for your communication can be important. And that's gonna be influenced in part by the, the tone of the leader of the unit. He or she is really the person who's going to be the face of the company and the, the face that kind of is contrasted uh, against, you know, in comparison to the union. Well, if this person is kind of bombastic and maybe a little bit unpleasant, uh, positive campaigning may not be the way to go. If, on the other hand, this person is genuinely respected and liked by most folks, um, then a positive campaign may make sense. Now, of course, the challenge here can be figuring out really how this person is viewed. I mean, most of the time, the, the leader of the facility is going to think he or she is beloved. Uh, sometimes they aren't, right? And so uh, figuring out exactly where uh, the views of the undecided voters are about this particular uh, leader uh, can be tricky to find out, but once you get that information, it can be very helpful in deciding what tone to use. There will also be things like buttons um, and other symbols of support um, uh, at, on the workstation, things along those lines. Employees are allowed to have these types of things. Um, th there are some rules about, you know, whether it's, it's offensive or things along those lines. And whatever you do, you want to make sure that you're consistent with applying whatever those rules are. Um, if you happen to be in a work environment that um, people are wearing uniforms and it's very important they look in a particular way, then you may have some ability to control the use of, of uh, stickers and, and pins and things like that. Uh, but many work environments, especially ones that aren't employer, employ, I mean, me, um, outside facing or customer facing, there's going to be less ability to control things like buttons and things along those lines. And you may not even want to. You may not want to control that because um, some of those buttons and things are going to be good for you. They're going to be sending a positive message um, about um, you know, what people view as, as a good union or, or a bad, I'm assuming people see uh, the, the negative things about the unions. So um, you'll also see a request for, uh, to sign petitions and authorization cards. Authorization cards are usually just small cards about the size of an index cards, although they can also be uh, eight and a half by 11 sheets. And the union wants to get these signed by as many people as possible. We'll see in a second that they need 30% of the people in the bargaining unit, the people who are gonna be eligible to vote to sign. So let's say there's 100 potential voters in the bargaining unit. Um, well, then that means that they will need 30 of those potential voters to sign an authorization card. They have to have that many before they can petition for an election. But unions almost always wait until they have over half having signed an authorization card. So in this case, at least 51 cards. Um, and very likely they'll wait a little bit longer. Uh, unions like to campaign as quietly as they can at first. And in fact, they will even tell uh, the workers in the facilities, shh, don't tell anyone. Even if you decide you aren't interested in the union, don't tell any management about it. Because the longer the union can keep the campaign secret, um, it means less time that the company will have to respond to those um, campaign issues. And so it's a little bit like if you have two candidates for public office and one starts a month before the other. Um, you can see how that could be a strategic advantage. So it's smart for the union not to want the campaign to become public. And um, so that process of collecting the authorization cards is, is part of that process. Now, once the petition for election is filed, then obviously it can't be a secret anymore. And most employers are actually gonna hear about it well before uh, the petition for an election is uh, submitted, especially if the bargaining unit is very large at all. Um, so the, the, the union has collected, we'll say, 60% of the eligible voters' cards, cards from those folks. Um, well, uh, hasn't the union won then? I mean, they only need 50% plus one, right? Well, no, they haven't won because an authorization card is not the same thing as a vote. Um, it's a little bit like if one candidate knocks on your door and says, hey, will you vote for me? you very likely will say yes, if for no other reason than you just want to get rid of this person who's knocking on your door, right? Um, and plus, you don't know who else is running or what they might have to offer you. And so you say yes, and then 
when you hear that, oh, there's another candidate in, in, in the election, you may well listen to that candidate. You might stay with the first guy, the, the guy that you indicated, yes, you'd vote for, uh, but you may also flip. And so that's the, the, the deal with the authorization cards. It does not bind a particular employee to a particular uh, position. Um, it's just one possibility. Uh, unions typically will continue to try to collect authorization cards even after they have filed a petition for an election. I think the logic here is that they think by having the employee sign the authorization card, the employee will in some sense feel obligated. Sometimes they may even think they're legally obligated, but even if they don't think they're legally obligated, they'll kind of feel morally obligated. Well, I gave my word I'd vote for the union, so I guess I should. That's the ethical thing to do. That's the honorable thing to do. So that may be part of what's going on in that thought process. Um, so there's a lot of different variables here. The one thing that we haven't talked about yet are the union meetings. Um, union, or, uh, in the union process, unions will be having meetings. They will be meeting uh, typically not at work, but they'll be meeting perhaps in someone's home. They may invite all of the potential employees to the union hall. They may rent out a Holiday Inn uh, meeting room or a, a facility along those lines so that everyone can come and um, they can hear more about unionization, at least with this particular uh, local. The employer has an advantage here. Now, in many senses, the deck is stacked against employers. As I said before, the union can kind of say whatever, I guess I haven't said this yet, unions can say whatever it wants to. It's not really bound by the truth. The employer is bound by the truth. So it's not unusual to see a, a union activists uh, exaggerate or just flat out lie to workers about how the collective bargaining process works or various and sundry aspects. For example, a union can lawfully say, well, if we get voted in, we can guarantee you that you're going to get another $2 an hour. Well, they don't have that power. And you might think, well, that sounds like an unfair labor practice. It sounds like something that uh, once the, the union gets voted in, if that gets revealed, then there ought to be a, a, a ULP against the union. No, um, the way the law set, the, what the law's response is, well, common sense would tell the, the employees that the union can't deliver on a promise of $2 more an hour. Common sense would tell the employees that the employer has to agree to whatever the terms are going to be. And so um, the, the employers, excuse me, the employees sure, surely understood that that was just uh, talk and it wasn't really a real promise. Um, maybe that's what the employee understood, but some of those employees can be rather naive about this and they can somehow think, well, the, the, the union can make them. The union can make the company do something. And so the, the union can lie but the employer can't lie. And the reason employers can't lie is because employers actually can change things. Um, so going back to um, the uh, uh, scenario where, let's say the employer were to say, well, uh, you know, in the collective bargaining process, um, uh, we can uh, make the union agree to this or that thing, or we can make this happen. Well, in some sense, the employer can because the employer is the employer, right? The employer has inherent power to do things. And so the, the NLRB says, well, since the employer does have inherent power, it would make sense for the employee to believe the employer when the employer says something that's not true. So an employer lie is an unfair labor practice. A union lie is not. And again, that's not something that may, may be readily obvious to the uh, employee. So that's one advantage that the unions have. Um, another, or but an advantage that the employer has is that the employer uh, can have union meetings in which the employees, the folks who are going to be voting, can be required to attend and that the employees can be compensated for their time on the clock. And this is very common to do. Um, when I have been involved in uh, campaigns in the past, there's typically two union meetings. One, kind of as soon as you can get it arranged. And then the second is, um, you, you can't do it literally on the eve of the election, but you do it, I think, maybe a little bit more than 48 hours before the vote, kind of as the last 
uh, hurrah, the last thing that the uh, uh, union member, or excuse me, the employees will see. Now, of course, the union can even talk um, after that, but but that's that's the philosophy. So these meetings uh, that you have with your workers, that of course the union isn't invited to, are really the the most probably the most important part of that uh, uh, process of, of that meet of that uh, event. Um, so once, once there's enough of those authorization cards, as I said before, the authorization cards, once you get 30%, then the union can, if it wishes to, file a petition for election. And they would file the petition with the National Labor Relations Board. But at, once the National Labor Relations Board confirms the authorization cards, then it will schedule an election, typically in about 30 days. Now, um, how do they confirm that the authorization cards are legitimate? Usually there isn't a lot of checking. The reason for this is that the union doesn't really have much of an incentive to submit forged or phony authorization cards because if they don't have at least 30% support, there's really very little chance they're gonna win the election. So why would the union go to that much hassle and that much effort to lose? That doesn't make sense. And so as a, as a practical matter, there isn't a lot of confirming that the cards themselves are legitimate. Now I said the election typically happens 30 days after the petition, but there can be, um, well, actually, before we get into it, let, let's talk a little bit about here. Um, asking employees about their attitudes towards unions is not per se a violation of the NLRB, NLRA, but it tends to be intimidating and coercive. So it's a best practice not to ask those questions. Typically, what you do in a large facility is you ask the supervisors to think about their say 20 or 30 or 40 uh, subordinates and go through and say, well, how many are pro-union? They don't even have to give names, but they kind of in their mind say, ah, I think Bob would vote pro-union. I think Sally would vote against the union. Teresa would be pro-union. Terry would be anti-union. And you go through and so you get a number. Um, oftentimes then what you do is you double. Whatever that supervisor said is the number of pro-union votes, you double that. Uh, because supervisors typically understate that. And that makes sense because the workers know that the supervisor does not support the union. So the pro-union worker is not going to go around, or many aren't, some are, but many are going to say, eh, I don't want to get into it with my supervisor. Um, I support the union, but he doesn't have to know that. In fact, I may talk about the union in a negative way just because either I want him to like me and I think this is a good way of doing it or I want to throw him off the scent and make it make him and the company think oh there's nothing to worry about this she has a, doesn't have a chance of winning they get lulled in a false sense of security election day comes the union gets voted in so uh, there definitely is a lot of opportunity on both sides for uh, miscommunication, misrepresentation. Um, intentional sometimes, maybe not so intentional other times. Uh, but you have to be skeptical of what you're hearing from your supervisors, and supervisors have to be skeptical of what they're hearing from the rank and file folks with whom they work. Employers cannot interrogate, ask questions, or poll employees to determine who wants a union and how employees tend to vote. Um, that will go through something called tips in a second. Th those are things that it, it would be unlawful to ask. Plus, you don't want that information because let's say a uh, Bob is pro-union and you directly ask him, how, do you, how are you going to vote, Bob? And Bob says he's going to vote for the union. And let's say then Bob is caught stealing. Well, what are you going to do? You have to fire him if he was caught stealing. And yet now it looks like it's a ULP. It looks like you're firing him because he wants to vote in favor of the union. And in fact, it's even possible that uh, Bob is going to intentionally create a set of circumstances that are going to force the employer's hand so the employer does fire Bob in the hopes that this will generate a ULP and that Bob will be able to kind of use this in the campaign. Oh, look, here's Bob. They fire Bob because Bob uh, refuses to uh, kowtow to them about um, unions. Anyway. Um, union employers though even though they can't pull the workers they can state their views regarding unions they can require attendance but they can't threaten prizes or benefits for voting a certain way so um, 
common question there and usually there's a presentation at the beginning of these meetings and then there's um, questions and so people will ask questions some of the questions are sincere how does this work or tell me more about this or what's going to happen if this happens but some of them are intentionally argumentative questions by the pro-union folks um, you know uh, how can you possibly justify this or blah, 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 whatever. Um, sometimes the questions are tricky. They're designed to maybe throw off the person, confuse the person, maybe cause the speaker to uh, misstate something that is going to possibly create a ULP. But one thing that the employer can't do um, is predict the future. Can't say, well, this is what's going to be in the collective bargaining agreement. Uh, you know, we're definitely not going to agree to higher wages. We're definitely not going, you know, I know lots of employees here really want um, a four-day work week, but there's just no way that's going to happen. That would be a ULP because you're saying we're not open to collective bargaining about that particular proposal. You're predicting what the result will be. Instead, what you can say is, look, um, as part of the collecting bargaining process, we'll have to sit down with the union if the union gets voted in and both sides will have to negotiate in good faith over the terms and conditions of employment. The union may well advance as an, as an option a four-day work week. We, uh, the company will also advance options, uh, some of which employees will like, some of which probably employees won't like. None of us knows what the final contract will look like or even for sure that there will be a contract. The one thing that we as the company would commit to do is we will definitely uh, negotiate in good faith. Beyond that, you know, we, we just don't know and, and neither does the union under those circumstances. That would be the way that um, an employer would respond to that question. Employers must not discharge or discriminate against pro-union employees. The employers must allow employees to engage in discussions about unionization at work during non-work time. In other words, whatever the usual rules are about uh, conversations, presumably there's going to be breaks and lunch periods where people talk about, you know, the Dallas Cowboys or um, what they had for dinner last night or what movie they saw over the weekend or union issues. And so you can't ex uh, exclude the from the uh, flow of conversation. Now, during the work day, um, it, it, there is, a, you know, when people are actually actively working, there's a little bit more control. But if this is a working environment where people talked about all kinds of things, let's say it's an assembly line, and in some sense, you can kind of turn off your brain while you screw in the widgets or whatever, and there's a lot of discussion and banter back and forth, well, then probably in that situation, uh, your ability to limit the, the unionization banter is going to be relatively small because after all, if you let people talk about their grandkids and you let people talk about the Dallas Cowboys, you're probably going to have to let them talk about unionization. Employers do need to permit employees to wear union buttons and the like and t-shirts and, uh, and, and to engage in stuff outside of work hours. Employers are not required to allow non-employee organizers access to the workplace. It has to allow the employees access and the employees have to be permitted to uh, distribute literature and things like that. Now, obviously the employees shouldn't be on the clock during this time and the employees who are receiving the literature shouldn't be on the clock at this time. Um, if um, There can be, there's a, there's a line of cases out there when an employer happens to be in a place where there really isn't a safe area where the union organizers can be that isn't the company uh, property, but isn't kind of in the middle of traffic. And so in those situations, obviously nobody wants anybody to get hit by a car. And so a, a, most employers under those situations will carve out a very small area in um, on their property saying, okay, the non-employee organizers can be in this small area um, uh, available to you know have their signs or have their brochures or whatever. Um, employers can control in that context just so no one is, is hit by a car or in jeopardy. The uh, employees though can't be controlled in that way because they have a right to be on the property because they're employees. Um, as we said before, the employer can't assist the employees in forming a union. The employer can be against the union or it can be neutral, but he cannot, the employer cannot be pro-union. That's again because we can't have company unions anymore. That's one of those statutory changes. 
So how do you avoid unions? You know, the most successful union campaign is the one that never happens. Um, the most successful union avoidance uh, uh, program is the one that never results in any need to do anything because the union never bothers because everybody's so darn happy at this place of employment, they wouldn't think to join the union. So how do you create that type of environment? Well, I guess the first thing to say is that you can do everything right and you can still have a union campaign. So when you get the union campaign, it doesn't necessarily mean you messed up. It means that, you know, things happen, that um, uh, you may have a, a single worker who used to work for a unionized facility and, and had a good experience and he's popular and he's charismatic or she's charismatic and they are able to persuade enough workers that this union thing might be a good thing. Um, there's just no way to predict some of those demographics or some of those events. And so the fact that you get a union campaign doesn't mean anybody did anything wrong, but when you don't have union campaigns, it's oftentimes an indication that you're doing the right stuff. So how do you avoid unions? Well, here are some things to keep in mind. One is monitor morale in the facility. If there is no union activity, you can have employee service. Once there's a union activity, you can't do that kind of stuff anymore. Uh, figure out what's on people's minds. Do they feel treated with respect? Do they feel that, they're, that they are uh, having some say in their work situation? Uh, do they feel like they're compensated enough? Those types of ideas. Simply asking them is tremendously empowering to people. Um, even if the answer you get isn't the best, people will feel to some extent that they've been heard and that in and of itself is a win. So you wanna listen, you wanna listen sometimes formally through surveys, through op open door meetings where people are allowed to let their hair down and say what's on their mind without any kind of repercussion, where senior managers in the facility are there to listen and you're there to just observe the work work environment? Are people smiling? Are people being efficient and going about their job in a productive way? Or are there lots of moody looks and slow and kind of demoralized appearances? These are subtle things. Uh, obviously, the day after a cowboy's loss is probably not the day to evaluate that in Dallas, but um, you, you want to be aware of that, to have that, that feel for the facility. You want the um, workers to know what's going on in the company. You want them to feel like they're part of this organization. Uh, so you want to talk to them about business goals and what's going up next and why we're doing what we're doing. Have them be a, feel like a part of that team. You also wanna do the right thing. You want to do things ethically and in a way that is legally compliant. And you want to let employees see that happen. Now, that doesn't mean that when you fire somebody that you have to go around, but you shouldn't go around saying, oh, the reason why I fired Bob was blah, 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 blah. No, you don't want to do that. And sometimes you will take personnel actions that you think to yourself, well, gosh, if everybody knew why we fired Bob, people wouldn't be mad at us. And they're mad at us now because they don't know. Um, that's going to happen sometimes. But in most cases, employees will give you a bit of a benefit of the doubt they will understand, well, we may not know everything about that situation. If it's an occasional situation wherein uh, they're having to trust, that's okay. But you want to have a lot of credibility. You want your word to be your bond, and when you say you're going to do something, you actually do it. And if you can't, you, you're up straight with people and say, up front with people and say, this is why we can't do it. And let me, let me explain to you what we're going to do instead. Um, you want to um, consider constantly how to increase uh, the union avoidance uh, uh, thing. So you want to make sure there's a free flow of information both from rank and file to senior management and from senior management back to rank and file. You want your uh, employees to feel like they matter, that they are contributing. And one way of doing this is by having uh, work teams that work to solve uh, practical, important questions. A common one is, is a worker safety team. Um, if you uh, discover that uh, there's an, a, a type of injury that's happening in your industrial work environment, you might create a team to figure out, well, what are some strategies we could develop to reduce the likelihood of that accident happening? 
I mean, that gets all kinds of benefits. One is it may reduce the number of injuries, which of course is a very good thing, both in terms of managing company expense. Also, it's a good thing in that you want your workers to be healthy and happy. And um, it's also a good thing in that the workers are going to feel like they're respected and that their opinion and um, experience and skills are valued within the organization. There are some problems with that approach, though. We'll talk about those in a bit. So these are just some examples of some union avoidance ideas. So let's talk about what we can't do. I already said something about TIPS earlier. TIPS is an acronym that stands for Threats, Interrogation, Promises, and Surveillance. Um, so these are things that an employer cannot do, cannot threaten workers. Well, if the union comes in, we'll close our doors. If the union comes in, we'll never agree to a, a wage increase. Um, we'll fire you if you vote for the union. Those types of things are threats. Those are prohibited. Interrogation, you can't ask questions of, of employees. You can't say things like, well, why is the union popular? Or how are you going to vote? Or do you think the union has enough votes? All of those it would be qualified as interrogations and, and are prohibited. You can't make promises. This is, of course, the, the opposite of a threat. You can't say, well, if the union doesn't come in, I, I, I know that we'll be able to, to uh, increase hourly rates by at least a dollar an hour. Um, you can't make promises along those lines. That's prohibited. And you can't surveil, you can't um, uh, tape and see who's taking the flyers, you can't uh, take down the names of the people who are distributing the flyers, you can't drive by the union hall in the, in the, at the time of the meeting and see whose car is around the parking lot. All of those are prohibited. These are kind of partnership ideas because here you're actually asking the question. Here you're using tools to get that same information without asking. But either way, you can't do either one of these activities. So these are the things that um, the employer is prohibited from doing. Now the union isn't prohibited from doing any of these things. So this is not a level playing field. But again, the employer has more uh, more ability to uh, control the working environment so the employer has some benefits too. Okay, so what are some tools or what are some techniques that the union is likely to engage in? One thing that the union is likely to do or oftentimes does is that it will have its authorization cards and it will perhaps even give them to someone in management and say, look, we've got more than 50%, you should just go ahead and recognize us. A good practice in this situation is to not, for the uh, employer, not to even look at those authorization cards because they don't really want to know who signed them. And they don't know if they're authentic or forged or whatever. And uh, in most cases, the employer's position is going to be, we want there to be a vote. Uh, the idea of democracy is such an important idea in our society that um, it's an easy sell for our employees or for employees to, to recognize that the employer doesn't just accept the cards because those cards were accumulated in lots of different scenarios, sometimes with the person signing the card feeling pressure to do so. Um, but the, the balloting process is going to be a secret ballot. We're really going to give everyone an opportunity to participate. And so it's a pretty easy sell in the work for the workers to understand why the employer wants to ensure that workers have that secret ballot. Um, the union is also going to very likely visit employees' homes. Um, unfortunately, the employer is required to give out that information to the, uh, to the union after the uh, 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 election uh, petition has been filed. Uh, the employer doesn't have any choice in this matter. Um, so the, the, the union now can know, ah, oh, that's where Bob lives. We're going to go knock on Bob's door. And so that can be a way of um, hoping to persuade Bob that, in fact, he ought to vote for the union. Then there are things called union salts. This has nothing to do with salt and pepper. This has to do with the union organizing technique that can be very, very effective. So imagine that you have a business agent. Um, there is a large facility in this particular town that is ununionized, and the uh, business agent for this union thinks, wow, it'd be great if we could get a union uh, uh, presence in this facility. That would generate uh, more revenue for the union, it, almost like selling more. If you're a car maker, you want to sell more cars. If you're a union, you want to have more members, because again, however many members you have means that's how much money that is going into your, your coffer, so to speak.
So the business agent says, ah, but I don't know how to, to really get into that facility. Um, maybe my ties to that facility aren't that strong. Well, what the business agent might do is just apply to work there. Um, and so he, once he gets on board, then he um, or she starts getting to know people and starts talking about the union. Well, I think the union would be great here. Wow, y'all don't y'all only have one break every uh, every shift. Gosh, if we had a union here, I'm sure we'd get two breaks. Boy, I think it's a bummer. We're only paid twelve dollars an hour. I think in union shops doing the same work, they're paid about fifteen dollars an hour. And so the the salt starts talking that way, starts kind of trying to become friends and, and being charming and plant the seeds of union interest. Um, the, uh, the employer really can't do anything to stop this. Um, let's say that when the business agent applied for the job, you know, he filled out his job application, he listed the fact that he spent the last 10 years working for the union as a business agent. Well, it was pretty obvious then that he's going to be a salt. And so the employer might say, well, we don't want to hire a union salt. We don't want to get organized. Can we say thanks, but no thanks? Unfortunately not. If he is qualified, if he's the most qualified for the job or she's the most qualified for the job, the fact that he or she might have the motivation of trying to unionize the facility is irrelevant. Now, of course, if he gets in the workplace and he isn't being productive, he isn't doing his work, and instead he spends his time fraternizing, then disciplinary action can happen. But the employer needs to be aware that it's very likely you're going to get a ULP. Ah, you fired me not because I wasn't being productive at work. You're firing me because I'm a union salt. And that's a prohibited reason for dismissing. So union salts can be a very smart strategy for the union to get inside the facility and to be able to campaign initially clandestinely, but eventually publicly. We already talked about the hand billing, having those brochures and informational picketing. This would be uh, pickets that are uh, put uh, uh, are, uh, put on display as employees come into the parking lot where they would come um, to work every day. So what are some common issues that unions typically latch on to or emphasize in campaigns? Well, each campaign is different. Each workplace is different. Each union is different. So what they identify with is going to vary depending upon the circumstances. So here's a list of common themes, but they are by no means a complete list. As you are considering union avoidance strategy in your workplace, you'll want to be sure you're addressing these types of concerns. One, of course, is job security. Everyone worries about the possibility of losing his or her job, either because of a downturn in the economy or some technological advancement, or uh, because of being replaced or uh, being re maybe outsourced to another, that the job function being outsourced to another part of the world, or maybe being fired for poor, for um, uh, capricious reasons, unfair reasons, maybe by a supervisor who uh, plays favorites or something along those lines. So job security can come up in lots of different contexts and you want your workforce to feel as confident as possible but on the other hand you don't want to lie to your workforce about how secure the job is um, and so that's a careful balancing act. Now the reality is that unions can't really increase job security. Um, in fact there's there's some reason to think in certain situations they can actually make job security less secure. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was at JCPenney, um, a while I was there, both Sears and Montgomery Ward got out of the catalog business. Uh, JCPenney uh, continued to have a catalog, continued to have a profitable catalog. Now, when I was uh, with JCPenney, it was uh, still relatively early in the days of the internet. So the catalog business was certainly an internet business as well, but um, uh, Amazon was not as big a player as it ultimately became. Uh, both Montgomery Ward and Sears, or both Montgomery Ward went belly up and ceases to exist, and Sears got out of the catalog business. Um, one factor in that was that Montgomery Ward and Sears did not adapt quickly enough to technological changes. Um, they stayed with kind of antiquated systems. Well, why did they do that? I mean, there are probably lots of reasons why they did that. 
but probably a piece of that story is that they a large portions of their facilities were unionized and it's more difficult to uh, be able to adjust your business model quickly when it, oftentimes in a union facility because you've got one more level of, of bureaucracy when you have an un non-unionized workforce you have to persuade senior management to invest here to make these changes but you don't actually have to negotiate with the workers if they are unionized then you do oftentimes have to negotiate over these issues with the workers and so you have to explain well you know the internet's coming or this or that's coming well, that's a lot to expect somebody to be able to process. Think about it. In 2000, did any of us think Amazon was going to be what Amazon is today? I mean, you almost need a crystal ball. You need a very, very sophisticated understanding of business. Um, and even the most sophisticated people don't have that in many cases. Imagine somebody who earns 12 bucks an hour on an assembly line and you're negotiating with him or her trying to make sense of some changes that are, are going to happen in the workplace. And he's like, well, Amazon, what's an Amazon? I don't know what you're talking about. This internet thing, that's not going anywhere. You can see how um, not knowing or having the sophistication or the time to immerse in these areas can cause another level of bureaucracy, another level of delay. Anyway. Obviously, there are examples where unions have been able to be fleet and quick to make the changes that are necessary. So it's not always the case, but it can be one of the reasons why uh, companies uh, find themselves uh, kind of left behind um, when they happen to be unionized. Another is capricious treatment. Um, management seems to do whatever it wants, doesn't consult with the workforce, does, isn't interested in being fair or consistent. Sometimes management is arrogant, hostile, abusive, um, neglectful. All of those things can happen. And of course, um, that requires more senior management to monitor what, what more junior management is doing. And it requires people outside the facility to come in and monitor as well. Um, it's a difficult thing to know what's happening in the unit on a day-to-day -day basis if you're not there on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is a genuinely challenging thing to monitor. One good way to do it is to have kind of a 360 review process to see what's on people's minds, how they like the management of the facility. Sometimes it's not so much hostility or unfairness, it's incompetence. Uh, this person doesn't know, the supervisor doesn't know what he or she's doing and it keeps on making bad decisions. Now union really, a union isn't going to change who the supervisors are. A union's not going to make that supervisor more competent, but you can see how somebody who's frustrated at work, who has a supervisor who keeps on making stupid decisions, might think, well, it can only be better with a union, right? I mean, that can be the thought process. Fairness of compensation and benefits packages. This can be in comparison to what other units are making, units within that company or units in that particular community that are doing similar jobs. Or it can be just more of a generalized sense of, I don't take enough money home to buy the things I need for my family. Or benefits have been going up at such a huge rate um, and the deductibles are so high, I don't. I feel so squeezed. I don't know how to, to breathe. I don't know how to manage uh, with, with the benefits that I'm receiving. Concerns about safety. Obviously, if you don't feel safe at work, that's a huge issue. Um, it's an issue of, of uh, management, the quality of management, uh, the competence of management to being able to keep the workforce safe is one of the most basic and most important things that management needs to be uh, responsible for. And if they fail the workers there, you can hardly blame the workers for seeking uh, representation outside. Um, fairness issues re uh, related to job status. Um, are uh, salaried employees treated better than hourly employees? Are a clerical employees treated better than uh, production or labor uh, or manual labor employees? Do there seem to be uh, favorites or different groups that are given more perks or more advantages? I mean, sometimes there will be some differences that probably make a difference. For example, um, let's say that a particular facility is not air conditioned, but uh, where the computers are is air conditioned. And so the workers who work in that area 
have, have the benefit of air conditioning. Well, you know, in that situation, you're not really air conditioning that part of the unit for the employees. You're air conditioning it for the computers, which need the, the to be at a certain temperature and a certain level of humil humidity. Um, so you have to just make those differences clear. You need to uh, let employees know why you're treating folks differently um, so that they won't draw some incorrect uh, conclusions. Generally, uh, an, important, an important union avoidance approach is to reward a seniority and longevity with the company. Many times in a union shops and also shops that are working to avoid unionization, there will be a job posting system. All jobs will be posted, excuse, excuse me, all uh, non-management jobs will be posted, and um, there will be some kind of point system where the most senior person, assuming that he or she is qualified for the job and isn't on some kind of disciplinary action, uh, will, if he or she applies, he or she will get the job. Um, and so it rewards that seniority aspect. Um, sometimes there's concerns about the lack of promotional opportunities. Um, uh, you know, do you have um, an organization that either uh, doesn't uh, uh, publicize the promotional opportunities or uh, uh, doesn't create some opportunities from time to time so people feel like that there's some place to go from here? And then, of course, violation of other personnel laws. Now you might say, well, how is a union going to help avoid uh, employment discrimination? Don't unions oftentimes discriminate? Well, certainly unions have had a long history, as many employers have had, of discrimination in the workforce. Um, and it is also true that uh, the, the, the more effective tool in eliminating discrimination would be going to the EEOC. Having said that, um, that isn't always the path that a particular employee happens to choose. And so an employer definitely wants to uh, minimize the, uh, the discriminatory practices, uh, hopefully make them zero, but certainly uh, reduce them to the greatest extent possible and also to make sure that they appear to be uh, not issues anymore, that um, people who uh, seem to be insensitive, maybe they're not really bigots, but they uh, use terminology that's dated, that isn't considered appropriate anymore, um, that those people are counseled. Hey, we don't use that word anymore. That's not okay. That's not an okay term to use for our, our colleagues in the work environment. Um, those kind of jokes aren't appropriate, whatever the thing might be. So this is a kind of a good roadmap for union avoidance. And it's also things to keep in mind when there is that union campaign. Very likely several of these issues will be on the minds of your employees. And of course, uh, the, the workforce isn't gonna be monolithic. Some are gonna be all about the money. When am I gonna get more money? Others will be all about uh, fairness and, and being treated with respect. And so you have different groups who have different reactions to these ideas. Okay, so we're, we, I've kind of took a break from the representational election topic to talk about kind of what happens before the, the representation, before the uh, election petition comes out, but now let's talk about how that election process goes forward. Okay, so we said before how, you know, the, the union is collecting authorization cards once it gets to 30% uh, of the potential voters, and that's when they can file for an election. But I said potential voters, right? And how do we decide who's a potential voter? You may recall in the first lecture, I talked about an appropriate bargaining unit. I talked about a community of interest. So after the union petition our election petition is submitted, there is oftentimes litigation about, well, who ought to be eligible to vote? And as I said before, sometimes the union just wants to pick off this department or that department. And the employer oftentimes wants a larger unit because of course the union is gonna focus on the departments that it has the strongest support. And so sometimes what'll happen is that the union just wants say the shipping department. And then there is a hearing over what the appropriate bargaining unit might be. Maybe the National Labor Relations Board comes back and says, well, it's the whole unit or it's 
you know, 90% of the union or 80% of the unit. It may be that the union walks away at that point. Well, we just don't have enough support, at least now, to proceed with the election. We don't have enough authorization cards, or we know that even if we do have enough authorization cards, we wouldn't be able to win the election today. And so what they may choose to do is to go back to campaign mode before they file an election petition because they need more time to develop that that uh, base, or perhaps they will you know, take it a break for a year or two and come back at some later time. So deciding what the appropriate bargaining unit uh, may be is going to be crucial to uh, what that campaign is going to look like and even whether that campaign is going to go forward or not. So we already talked about the 30% necessary in order to uh, have an election. If in a majority of employees who cast votes in the uh, appropriate bargaining unit choose union representation, the NLRB will certify the union as the exclusive representative of all employees in that particular bargaining unit. And again, it may be the whole facility or it may just be the shipping department if that's what they've concluded is the appropriate bargaining unit. So let's let's go back to our example. You know, remember we had 10 employees in the shipping department, we had 10 employees in the front office, and we had 50 employees in the production department. Well, let's say that the NLRB decides that the shipping department is an appropriate bargaining unit. There's an election and the majority of those employees choose to have the union represent them. Well, now these 10 employees are in the bargaining unit and this unit will be subject to a collective bargaining with the employer. The other 60 employees are not affected directly by this. They, they aren't going to be part of that collective bargaining agreement if one is agreed to. There will be slight changes probably in their working situation, um, but for the most part, their work lives will remain the same. Whatever the benefits were they previously enjoyed will probably continue to be their benefits going forward. Now, it's not unusual if the union kind of gets a toehold in the facility that they will then attempt to organize other parts of the facility. So oftentimes that first union campaign is just the first of many. Let's talk about decertification elections. These are quite rare. The union will oftentimes say to the workers, well, you know, vote us in, give us a try. Uh, if we don't work out, you can always vote us out. If we do work out, you've got yourself a good representative. So either way, you're going to be fine. And so many times the union will leave uh, potential voters with the impression that it's not that difficult to get rid of a union. The reality is that decertification elections are rare because they are very, very difficult uh, to uh, get sufficient interest. The union doesn't have to play by as many of the, the rules that the employer has. And the employer can't take an active role in a decert petition. So there's just the, the employees are just going to hear one side. And as you can see, it's very, very difficult. Now, if it's a really small unit, it's possible for there to be a decert. But if it's a large unit, just the logistics logistics of organizing such a campaign really requires some folks to be very sophisticated and very committed. And since the employer can't take on that role, it's really a long shot. So typically once a union is voted in, it's going to be there for the foreseeable future. I think I said this before that while the employer can't support the union, the employer can voluntarily recognize the union once the union has shown over 50% of the people in the bargaining unit have signed authorization cards. Most employers choose not to follow that path again because authorization cards are not necessarily good indications of, of what those particular employees really want to do with the union. Lots of times people sign those cards without really understanding them. And again, that secret ballot is what our kind of democracy is about. And so um, most employers want the employees to have that opportunity. So that's that card check procedure that we were just talking about. So the employer agrees to recognize the union if a majority of employees sign authorization cards. Also, if the union and the employer already have um, an, a collective bargaining agreement of some other facility or some part of this current facility, there may actually be a term in that contract that requires that the employer be neutral about any additional 
collective bargaining. So going back to the example of the shipping department that gets unionized, maybe part of that collective bargaining agreement will provide that the employer agrees not to oppose unionization of the production department or the clerical department. Well, as soon as the employer agrees to remain neutral, it's very, very likely that the rest of the facility will become unionized. Because again, if you only hear from one side in an election, most people, when they hear from the one side, will say, well, that makes sense. Nobody else is telling me anything different, so I'm going to go with that perspective. Okay, and once the union has been voted in, it becomes the exclusive representative for the folks in that unit. The employees themselves don't have the power to directly negotiate the terms and conditions of employment. So going back to that 10 unit shipping department, let's say that in that 10 unit, um, Bob is the shop steward. That's the person selected to uh, be the bargaining person. And then we'll say that Teresa, who is the um, board agent, not board agent, I'm sorry, bar business agent for the union. They're the two people who are negotiating with the company. A Sally is also in the shipping department and Sally has very different views from Bob. Bob is all about increasing the benefits. Sally doesn't care about benefits. Her spouse uh, provides very good benefits through his or her employment. And so Sally doesn't even buy benefits to this employer. What Sally wants is a higher hourly wage rate. But that's not what Bob and Teresa are going to focus on. Now Sally might want to go to the employer directly and say, listen, well, this is what I think we ought to do. But Sally isn't the representative of the unit. And so she doesn't have the capacity uh, to to be involved if um, uh, she hasn't been elected to that role within the union. Representation by a union is different than being a member of the union. Um, we'll talk, well I guess we'll talk now about it. So you know after the the union is voted in the union will typically start uh, up until that point even if you sign an authorization card Typically, those individuals haven't actually joined the union. They're certainly not paying union dues. And in fact, the union will say, listen, you don't have to pay any union dues until we get voted in. And that's when the union dues will start. They may even say you don't have to pay union dues until we get a, a signed contract. So, um, so when, when you become a member, and that's a choice that you're making, that's when the dues are going to uh, kick in and be uh, applicable. Being represented by the union is different than being a member of the union. In Texas, you can be in the bargaining unit and opt not to join the union, but still the union is going to be your exclusive representative with the company, even though you have elected not to join the union. So they obviously can marry up. You can be a member of the union and also be represented by the union, or you can not be a member of the union and still be represented by the union. It's even possible to be a member of the union and not be represented by the union. You can be a member of the union and you are working in a place that isn't unionized. That could happen. So while many times these two concepts are related to each other, they don't have to be. So let's talk about union security provisions. Um, there are, uh, let me first of all do a refresher about employment at will because the, the idea of a right to work and employment at will oftentimes gets conflated in people's minds. So a little refresher. Uh, at will employment means that you, the employee, have the right to quit your job at any time with or without notice or with or without a reason uh, or good reason, bad reason, whatever reason you can leave at any time. It also means that the employer has those same rights to end the employment relationship at any time with or without notice for good reason, for a bad reason, for any reason as, as long as it's not an unlawful reason. It can be a stupid reason. It just can't be an unlawful reason. That's what at-will employment is about. Uh, Right to work is very different. It has nothing to do with that concept. About half of the states in the United States are right to work, and the other half are union security states. 
generally speaking, the farther south you go, the more likely you are to have a state be a right to work state. And the farther north you go, the more likely it is that the state is a union security state. Texas is a right to work state. So what does it mean when we say you have a right to work? Well, both terms are not necessarily the clearest. They're a little bit of propaganda, to be honest with you, in these terminologies. So think about it. So uh, both terms have to do with situations in which the workforce in this particular facility is unionized. So there is no issue about right to work or union security in an environment that is not unionized. But let's say you get a job at ABC Company and you are going to work on the assembly line there. Uh, you show up to work and you're told, maybe you knew this before, maybe you didn't, hey, this is a unionized facility. You've just joined this employer and, and you're actually working in the bargaining unit. And so the shop steward is going to come up to you and say, hey, welcome. Hope you enjoy working here. If you've got any questions, let me know. I'm the union steward. I'd like for you to join the union. This would be a great opportunity for you. You can get involved. You can be on this committee. You can be on that committee. And you might say at first, I mean, you might say that sounds great. I want to sign up and join. And so then you would sign up and uh, your dues would be deducted probably directly from your paycheck. And you would never see those dues because it'd be an automatic process. But you might say, oh, gosh, I mean, um, I, I, I need my money. I, I don't have any extra money to give to the union. And so I don't want to join. Um, and the union shop steward is probably going to say, well, think about it. You know, I'll, uh, I'll talk to you some more about it. I want to encourage you to join. And so he might or she might start, you know, giving you the reasons that he or she thinks it'll be helpful for you to join the union. At first, he may try to be very charming and likable and try to persuade you in essence. At some point, he may try to be a little bit more intimidating. Well, everyone else joins. Well, you know, you're not pulling your fair share. What do you, these other people aren't going to really want to be your friend if you're not a member of the union. Um, and so you can feel pressure from that standpoint to join. But let's say you hold your ground and you decide, nope, I'm not going to sign up. Uh, I'm not going to pay union dues. I don't want to be a member of the union. Maybe you don't happen to agree with the political positions this union has taken or something along those lines. Anyway, for whatever reason, you don't want to join. Well, you can't be forced to join the union in Texas. Um, you can't be forced to pay union dues in Texas because we are a right to work state. Now you are still going to be bound by the terms of the collective bargaining agreement. And those uh, terms might require that you deal with the shop steward. Let's say you have a grievance. Let's say you were passed over for a promotion that you feel you were qualified for. Well, if you're going to grieve that, if you're going to file a grievance, you're going to have to go through the shop steward. Um, so you're going to have to know the terms of the uh, collective bargaining agreement and follow those terms and deal with the union officials. Um, they are required by law to not discriminate against you simply because you have chosen not to be a member of the union. But they don't have to be nice about it. I mean, they, you know, they, they, they have to follow the law, but they don't necessarily have to like it, I guess is maybe one way of putting it. And so you have a right to work even if you elect not to be a member of the union. Many union people think that that's not fair because I, the new employee who's elected not to join the union, am a free rider. I'm getting the benefits of unionization without paying for it. Um, obviously, there needs to be employees of the union who are assisting the um, uh, members of this bargaining unit in negotiating, in um, uh, developing the uh, position for the collective bargaining agreement negotiations, assisting the uh, members of the uh, bargaining unit in handling grievances. There also needs to be members of the union for uh, you know, th that can actually organize facilities. I mean, you, they don't get more units in their union just by happenstance. It requires, you know, effort on the part of the unions to do that. And so all of that is where union dues go. Also, uh, many unions contribute to political campaigns, supporting candidates that they think are going to be pro-union and therefore advocate for legislation that will help unionization become more strong. And so uh, an, an employee who isn't contributing to, through dues is also not contributing to those efforts. So you can see that I, who have chosen not to join the union, I'm getting all the benefits of union membership without having to pay the 
in some cases very reasonable costs of those benefits. That's why some states are what we call union security states. It's lawful under the NLRA to be a right to work state or a union security state. So how does union security states work? Union security states say, or, or the, the, they, they have a law that says that when the union is voted in uh, and collective, bargain, collective bargaining uh, negotiations start, the um, union and the employer can negotiate over whether um, the employees will have to all join the union in order to maintain their employment. Um, whether this is going to be a union shop or not. Um, and so if uh, the, if uh, and almost always the union very strongly wants this because after all, there's really no point in organizing a facility if no one's gonna pay union dues, right? So the union dues is how the union pays for its building, pays for its employees, doing all those kinds of things. And so it's very interested in making sure that it's getting uh, dues and so, probably its most important negotiating issue is making sure in those states where it's lawful to have a union security clause. Um, of course, the employer doesn't have to agree to a union security clause. The employer can say, no, nope, we're not interested in that. That doesn't meet our interest. We are not going to go ahead with that. Um, and that, of course, can be subject to negotiation to the give and take. So the union might come back and say, well, okay, we understand you don't want the union security clause, but we'll give something up. Um, right now, you give the workers eight uh, paid holiday days. What if we reduce that to seven? If we reduce it to seven paid holiday days, uh, would you then agree to have a union security clause? The employer at that point might say, well, that's gonna save us you know, $100,000 a year. Uh, the union security clause doesn't cost us any money, so we're up $100,000. So the employer is probably going to say, yeah, that's a good economic move for us. We agree to that. So again, that give and take process of negotiation, more likely than not, because it's so important to the union and the employer doesn't really care too much either way, that's going to be a provision in states that could permit this. So what does it mean that you have this a union shop clause? Well, it means that when a new employee comes on board, he will or she will have uh, at least 30 days to join the union. Um, if he or she chooses not to join the union, then at the end of that 30 days or whatever the contract provides, then he or she will no longer be eligible to work in the bargaining unit. He or she can remain employed by the company in some other position, but not in the bargaining unit. Um, and so under that situation, that employee won't, quote unquote, have the right to work unless he or she chooses to join the, um, the union. Now, it, there are times where people object to union membership because of religious issues. Maybe their religion prohibits joining a union. And so there can sometimes be accommodations of that. For example, uh, the person may be uh, alternatively be permitted to donate the dues that he or she otherwise would have been giving to the union to some kind of charity or something along those lines. So what does the union steward do? Well, he or she collects dues, recruits new members from the new workers, uh, recruit, recruits union members out of the new workers. And, he, and if there's a, a problem with some collective bargaining provision that the, uh, 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 an employee, not just union member, but any employee um, feels violated, then the union steward is going to contact the employer and discuss the issue. So the union steward is the representative of the employees within the bargaining unit. Okay, so again, Texas is a right to work state and it prohibits those kind of union security provisions and collective bargaining agreements that we were just talking about. So now we have concluded our discussion about union campaigns and elections. I hope that I've captured at least a little bit of the excitement and the drama of this process. Um, we'll talk about collective bargaining in the next uh, lecture that we do. I didn't have time to cover it to, uh, in this one, I apologize. So in our next, we'll cover the second most interesting topic. I thank you for your attention. If you have questions, of course, please reach out to me. My email is cgroover at or better yet, stop by and we can talk 
talk at great length about union campaigns. Always an interesting field of discussion. Again, thank you so much for your attention, and you, I hope you have a wonderful day.